I'm Steve Higgins and welcome to this short video. Liz and I are off to France in our motorhome and rather than endure the long haul south to Folkestone and the horrendous traffic queues and delays, we've decided on another route. Uh, this time we're going to go on the ferry from Hull to Zeebrugge in Belgium and then drive down from Belgium into France. Here we are coming from St Anne's in Lancashire on the slip road from the M55 to the M6 South and then we're going to take the M62 into Yorkshire for the ferry port at Hull. This route involves only a two and a half hour drive and one interesting aspect of it is that although Yorkshire folk and those of us from west of the Pennines are sworn enemies, we're both northern and so a little northern humour and banter was the order of the day when we arrived at Hull. Here we are actually arriving at Hull ready to board the ferry after a trip of 142 miles and two and a half hours. Actually two hours 37 minutes according to Google Maps. The ferry port is located at the eastern edge of the city and the port handles more than a million passengers per year. Strange to think that this huge metal ship can actually float, especially when you consider all the vehicles that are on board. There are two vehicle decks that go around in a loop so you actually exit the vessel uh, the same way that you entered. Just time to give you a couple of uh, facts as well as the Brugge in Belgium there are also regular sailings from Hull to Rotterdam in the Netherlands and the origins of Hull go back to the 1100s. In 2017 Hull was named as the UK City of Culture. So here we are about to park up in this, uh, I think it's lane 3 I'm going to go behind this Ford Transit van. I think it's a Ford motorhome actually. Um, not quite, not quite like ours. As is a, a Ford Transit van with a chausson body, a French body. So there we are, fully parked, handbrake on, and that's where we're going to stay uh, for the voyage. Get a notebook out and make a quick note of that deck, deck six. Uh, I always forget that one when I'm coming back to our vehicle when we exit the ferry. Anyway, deck six. Here we are up on the deck where our cabin is. Just going to check the plan, see if we can find it. Yeah, it looks like our cabin is somewhere down this corridor. There was just one problem though. We found our cabin but had no key. On Brittany ferries that we're more used to, they use a key card. But here at Piano, it's an old fashioned key. So we had to go in search of the ship's staff to get our key and gain entry. Still, it gave us the chance to check out the ship's impressive stock of whiskey. Any special offers on single malts, I wonder? The ferry itself was a delight to travel on. Our steak in the restaurant was excellent and so was the wine. The bar was very northern in atmosphere and there was a vocalist, or a turn as we see up north, and a keyboard man who knocked out some very nice songs indeed. This is the outside of the ship, quick check on the, the lifeboats and then it's off to sleep and we woke in the morning in Belgium. There was no knocking on our cabin door by the ferry staff, eager to get in and clean up for the next batch of passengers, which is what we're used to with the Brittany ferries. Now with p &O, everything was a little more relaxed, a little more, dare I say, northern. Anyway, Belgium was looking nice and bright. This is us exiting the ferry. Uh, you can see on the right hand side there that's the way we came in and uh, just going out on the other side outside of a, a big loop. Just a few quick facts about Zeebrugge. Uh, it's Belgium's most important fishing port and the wholesale fish market there is one of the largest in Europe. Apart from being a passenger terminal, Zeebrugge serves as the central port for Europe's automotive industry. Now we're just going over the, uh, the little bridge that takes us from the ship onto dry land and here we are setting off in Belgium. Just over on the left there is the ship. Uh, it's actually much bigger than I thought it was. The thing is when we arrive there we're only seeing it from the tail end. Uh, so it's hard to, to pick up at first just how big the ferry is. Here we are just coming up to the passport check area and it's so nice to just sweep past and uh, on into Belgium. I doubt if we'll be doing that next time we come this way, if we come back in uh, 2020, uh, if and when I should say we leave the European Union. Maybe we will, maybe we won't, we'll see what happens. Must remember to drive on the right hand side, although I've done that so many times now I'm pretty used to it. 
I should tell you that 99% of this film was shot with my GoPro camera uh, that affixed to my window. It can be a little bit unreliable. A few months earlier on another trip to France I took what I thought was some spectacular footage driving through the Alps in an unseasonable snowstorm but when I later transferred the file to my laptop they just wouldn't play. Anyway here we are in the small village of Le Puy Notre Dame. Uh, very tiny, narrow little streets, typical French village. The reason, one well, of the reasons we came to France so earlier this year was to watch the Retro Grand Prix in this village. Uh, it's a vintage motor race through the streets of the village with pre war motor cars and motorcycles. As we drive through searching for a parking place, you can see the straw bales which are just being positioned for the race. One problem here was that the mo motorhome parking area had been taken over by the race teams uh, but happily we did find somewhere to park a little bit further on. Yeah, Le Puy, Notre Dame. We came here a few years ago and found it very fascinating. This is uh, what we say in Formula 1 terms, Turn 1. And what the guys did there was move those straw bales after each event. So people could get through to the paddock, uh, go to the bar, get their sausages and whatnot, not The cars assemble in a makeshift paddock before making their way to the track. Actually, the, very sh the village streets uh, lined just as they were in the past with straw bales. Motor racing in the pre-war years was a different thing to modern Formula 1. These huge steering wheels without power steering, narrow wheels with tyres made for normal motoring rather than specialist racing tyres and the drivers used cloth, cloth helmets and goggles rather than crash helmets. The stars of those years, people like Nuvolari, Prince Bira, Henry Seagrave were a different breed to modern drivers. Still, whatever the error, Racing drivers the world over love the speed, the competition and the winning. Although winning a race in some of these classic cars that we observed at Le Puy Notre Dame must have been a formidable achievement. It's amazing really that these mostly pre-war cars look so modern when you get close up to them. I love these cockpits. Just imagine manhandling these old cars on the circuit at full speed, throwing them into a classic four-wheel drift. We don't see much of that in modern Formula 1 these days, where the cars with their sticky tyres and aerodynamic downforce are literally glued to the racetrack. Here's another one of those cars, streamlining in reverse. Crazy, isn't it? Uh, I think I remember reading in the programme there were 160 vehicles at the, at the Retro Grand Prix, including these three-wheeler cars, the four-wheelers, and the, the motorcycles. Uh, this is just exiting the paddock, uh, the three-wheeler race about to start. These guys are now just cleaning the windscreen, warming the engines up, ready for the three-wheeler race. I just makes me wonder 160 vehicle 160 classic vehicles I wonder what the total value of these vehicles were I guess it was a, I guess it was a few million pounds I certainly wouldn't be surprised anyway I really did enjoy looking around the paddock a nice glass of uh, beer two euros some fruit and looking at these lovely cars I do love these cabs just imagine myself sitting in there working that steering wheel this one looks a little bit on the bare side, but even so, I just fancy getting in there, throwing that round a few corners. Uh, the thing is, I'd probably be terrified of smashing it up. This particular vehicle looks really, really modern. It looks like something out of the 1960s rather than uh, a pre-war vehicle. Austin 7, I think that is. Uh, I have to zoom into it later and double check. Anyway, here are the motorcycles. This I certainly wouldn't like to throw these... Uh, these bikes around the track uh, in fact uh, when we come to see some of the races later you see that the motorcyclists were a little bit ginger they just went gingerly around the corners this is the start of one of the first motorcycle races we watched and uh, just watch these guys they're not really sort of laying it down uh, like we see in moto gp but uh, they're certainly putting a lot of effort effort into it but uh, i should imagine a, a vintage motorbike I can see that being a little bit scary, uh, throwing it round those corners. This was the the start of the first motor race, and um, 
this is, as I say earlier on, this is turn one and following one turns. That straight there is a pretty wide road for this village. Uh, we did drive around the village on the previous day and it's very, very narrow streets. In fact, some of those streets is just single file traffic. Uh, but these guys are really throwing these cars around this bend. Just listen to those tires squeal. too soon it was time to return back to the UK it would have been nice to have come back the same way as we come via Zeebrugge and Hull but it was pretty expensive going that way so to keep the cost down came back the cheap and cheerful way on the shuttle from Calais to Folkestone uh, the, shuttle mu the shuttle must make a great deal of money when you think about it but then looking at it again when you look at the size of the operation there's massive amounts of land on either side the maintenance all the staff they have to get uh, pay for uh, i just wonder how much it costs it must cost an incredible amount they obviously make a profit otherwise it just wouldn't be running now normally at your road tunnel whenever i go to check in i will always choose the wrong check-in lane no matter what it's like being at asda when i always choose the slowest checkout Anyway, on this occasion, I've actually chosen well for a change. High technology equipment has already scanned our number plate and they know exactly who we are. I don't know if you call that little screen down there. Welcome, Mr. S. Higgins, it said. In a lot of ways the, the shuttle is a great way to travel to and from France. You just drive onto the train, put on your handbrake and you're whisked across La Manche as the French call it. In around 36 minutes you're able to stay in your vehicle and relax. I have to confess though I was really tempted to turn the gas on and make ourselves a cup of tea. Don't think that would have gone down very well with the Eurotunnel staff. Travelling from France to the UK in a tunnel under the sea, who would have believed it possible? Amazing really. So let's see now, what's the route back home? M20, M25, M1, M6, M55. Uh, maybe I should have shelled out and gone the Zeebrugge hole after all. Anyway, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little video. Here we are exiting the shuttle complex at Folkestone uh, on our way back home. Hope you enjoyed the film. I'm Steve Higgins and uh, you can go to my website stevehigginslive.com for more videos, information, also a weekly blog post. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time at stevehigginslive.com. <laughs>